What's up, guys? Welcome to another week of Mini Bites. We are actually on our last week of servitude and the last week of going through the letter of Romans, the book of Romans. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans chapter 16. And we are going to look at Romans chapter 16, verses 17 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 27. We're going to skip verses 1 through 16 because we're going to cover that in part 2 on Sunday morning. Hopefully you can come to uh, see it live at uh, Church at Whistling Pines, or if not, it will be available on the, the platforms, YouTube, uh, live stream, or uh, Church at Whistling Pines or whistlingpines.org um, to, to view that if you'd like. Uh, verses 1 through 16 is uh, some personal greetings that, that the Apostle Paul gives. And in that, he either greets or commends uh, 27 different names. And of those 27 names, 10 of them are female. And so what we're going to do in part two of this week is we're going to look at women in ministry. So you don't want to miss that. But today, we're going to skip again to, to verse 17, and we're going to talk about the parting thoughts of the Apostle Paul in this letter to the Romans. So let's go ahead and look at verse 17. Verse 17, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am, I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. So from verses 17 through 20, he's talking about watching out for false teaching. So for 16 chapters, this, this lengthy letter to the, to the church at Rome, he's really been, uh, this is his grandest letter really, about the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of grace, the difference between the law and grace. This is his treatise, really, of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. And so he ends his letter with telling them, beware, watch out, be vigilant, be careful about those who would come in and give you some false teaching, something different from what this letter is teaching you. And so within this, what he's saying is anything that is false will cause divisions among you. We've been talking about that for the last several weeks, that anything that's false will cause divisions. And it'll also put obstacles in our way. Anything that goes against the grain, anything that goes against scripture will put an obstacle in our way, will cause us to trip and fall will cause us, obviously, to sin as well. It will cause us to go after our own devices and cause us to not have faith in Christ alone. He says to keep away from them, keep our distance. He's not saying uh, don't listen intently. He's not saying um, don't uh, adopt it com completely, uh, take it with a grain of salt. He's not saying any of those kind of things. He's saying keep away from them completely. So we have to be careful what we listen to, what we read, what we adopt, the church that we go to, uh, who we listen to, all of those kind of things. You have to be careful what I say. All of those things, we have to listen to what we hear and take it to scripture and make sure that it lines up. And then he says, they are not serving the Lord, but their own appetites that actually false teachers are not serving the Lord. They're serving their own appetites. They're doing so to get an audience. They're doing so to get a following, to get 
their own notoriety, to get their own fame, to get their own pocketbook lined, to get their own uh, book signings, to get their own, in some cases, private jets or, or cars or nice houses or, or income or whatever the case might be. They're doing so for their own appetite, for self, not for Christ's gain, not for Christ's glory, but for their own glory. And so there's three main questions that we need to ask of any teaching to find out, is this a teaching that, that is of Christ Jesus? Now, there's obviously other questions and, and, and avenues that we need to, to decipher as well, but these are the three main questions that we need to ask. Number one, does it agree with scripture? Now, this could be difficult, and this is why we need to know Scripture. We need to be aware of what Scripture says. We need to be um, accustomed to knowing Scripture and, and not just cherry-picking Scripture, all of Scripture. We can open up Scripture and just take one, one thing out and make a doctrine of it, but we would be in error of it. We need to know what the whole counsel of Scripture says. So does what someone teaches, uh, does it line up with the whole counsel of Scripture? Number two, does it glorify Jesus Christ? Not self, not the teacher, and then also not the hearer. Not does it lift me up as the hearer? Does it make me feel good? But does it glorify Jesus Christ? That's the most important of all. Does it glorify Jesus Christ? And then the third, does it promote goodness? Or in other words, is there good fruit involved? If I do this or don't do this, will it produce good fruit? And it's not just if I do this, will it produce good fruit? But if I do this, is it glorifying Jesus and producing good fruit? So in other words, if I do it, is it out of the right motive? If Am I doing it in order to uh, earn salvation? And if so, then it's not glorifying Jesus. It might produce good fruit, but it's not glorifying Jesus. And it's not the gospel, it's the law. So it's got to be all three, and it doesn't line up or agree with Scripture. And so it's got to be all three of these. Otherwise, it's false teaching. Even if the false teacher may just be in error, these three things need to be lined up. Now, the false teacher may need to be corrected, just as um, in Scripture we, we have references where a teacher was corrected. So we may need to do the same thing. Then from 21 through 24, we, we have some more greetings. So let's read these. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my relatives. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Tertius was the one that Paul dictated this letter to. So Paul was actually the one that penned it, but uh, someone else actually wrote it down as Paul was was dictating it to him. And Paul allowed Tertius, the one that was actually writing it down, to also send his greeting. Tertius was also a fellow believer. So he sends his greetings as well. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother, Quartus send you their greetings. Now, verse 25 through 27 is a doxology. This is how uh, the Apostle Paul ends this letter, this epistle to the church. A doxology is a praise to God. He ends it with just a, a, an absolute glorious praise to God. But we can learn a couple things from this, this doxology as well. I'm going to read it through and then give you uh, two points. Verse 25 through 27. Now to him 
who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So going back to verse 25, he says, Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Notice he says, first of all, by my gospel. He's not just taking ownership like it's no one else's gospel. But what he's saying is that he he is saying it's his gospel. It's not his alone, but by my gospel that I've written to you, that, that this is my gospel. This was declared to me by Jesus Christ himself that he had a personal witness, a personal declaration by Jesus Christ himself, a personal witness, a, a, a personal um, visitation by Christ himself. And this was given to him by the Holy Spirit. And so what he's saying is, what I have written to you in this letter, this let this establish you. This word establish in the Greek is stay ridzo. Stay ridzo means to stand to set fast, literally to turn resolutely in a certain direction or to confirm and to strengthen. So what he's saying is now him, Jesus, is able to establish you by this gospel that I just wrote to you and and the proclamation of Jesus Christ is able to allow you to stand firm in this direction that you are heading, that, that you're able to stay in this direction, you're to be confirmed and strengthened and to be immovable. You're not to move from the course that you are in. Wow, how amazing. Move up further. Um, we just read it, verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. That he was he just got done talking about how people will flatter you and, and there'll be false teachers and things like that. That that Satan is real and that that uh Satan is behind all deception that that is facing the church, and that soon Satan will be crushed under our feet. And the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you, that, that that is the key, that is the channel in which we will have victory, that soon when Christ returns, Satan will be taken care of. He will be chained for a thousand years, then he will be cast into the lake of fire, and that he will be no more, and that, that we're able to, until that day, stand because we're established in the gospel. We're established in the proclamation of Jesus Christ. So we're able to stand against any false teaching. We're able to stand against any schemes of the devil, of Satan, of the enemy. So we're able to be established because of what Jesus has done for us. Also notice it says in verse 26, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and obey him. Believe and obey. Uh, faith and obedience always go together. In order for us to have faith, there's always obedience. If we have true faith, then obedience always flows from our faith. And so, if we're established, then we have faith. And if we're established and we have faith, then we obey. And through this letter, we have a great foundation to be established, to believe, and to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for going through this journey with me through the book of Romans. Uh, again, 
part two, we're going to talk about something incredibly important, something that isn't talked about enough, and that is women in ministry. So that's going to be part two on Sunday. Hopefully you can join me.